it's really actually a very interesting time in, in the world of heart failure. Uh, there's a lot of attention being paid to heart failure, as you know, for a variety of reasons. One is obviously it's such a large patient population that we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, but it's also one of the biggest patient populations that has readmissions and as a consequence of which I think all our institutions are always, you know, potentially facing these penalties for readmissions. You know, when I look at heart failure across our hospital, so our hospital at Mass General is about a thousand bedded hospital. At any point in time, cross-sectionally, there are about 120 patients admitted with heart failure. So it's not a trivial number. And these patients are all, you know, getting discharged. They're already sick. The propensity for them to get readmitted is so high. And I think all of us have had this really big challenge of how do we deal with these patients? And many of these are, are hef ref so they have reduced ejection fractions and have implanted devices. Um, and, and, and I think today's symposium is largely kind of directed towards how can we use those implanted devices and use the signals that come from some of these devices that Boston Scientific has, which is called the heart logic, which you're going to hear a lot about from our esteemed faculty out here. And how do we use that in clinical practice to provide better care uh, to our patients, uh, provide point of care wherever they are without them ha having to actually come into hospital uh, and improve outcomes? So I'm, I'm really excited for uh, what our faculty have today. We have a really to say today. We have a tremendous faculty. We have uh, Dr. Beamer, as you can see, is from uh, Hershey uh, Medical Center in uh, Pennsylvania. We have Dr. Nair from Arkansas, from the St. Bernard's Heart and Vascular Center. Uh, and we have Andrew Saar uh, from the University of Kansas Health System. Uh, all luminaries in the field and all really experienced with using heart logic uh, and multi-sense strategies in managing their patients. So. Without further ado, I'm going to request John uh, to come up and uh, educate us. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I appreciate uh, the invitation to participate th in this. And this has uh, been a journey for me that's been going on for about 11 years or more. Uh, when discussions began about developing a uh, multi-sensor algorithm for the detection of heart failure. And it's really a, a pleasure that this is now coming uh, to fruition. So I'm going to talk about uh, a trial called the multi-sense trial. The multi-sense trial was an observational study uh, which included an algorithm development and validation uh, cohort in order to develop uh, what the algorithm is that is now heart logic. And the goal was to develop an alert algorithm for the early notification of worsening heart failure by combining information from a diverse set of implantable sensors chosen to target different aspects of heart failure pathophysiology associated with common signs and symptoms of worsening heart failure. Seen at the top are heart sounds, thoracic impedance, respiration activity, and heart rate. And looking at them individually, starting with heart sounds, for anybody who's ever seen a phonocardiogram, and probably in an audience like this, we have half a dozen to a dozen who have, um, this looks like a phonocardiogram. It is not a phonocardiogram. It's not a signal of sound at all. It's actually a signal of vibrations picked up by an accelerometer, and in this specific case, in a pacemaker, uh, that looks like a phonocardiogram. You can see very nicely the first heart sound represented here, the second heart sound here, and this particular patient had a loud third heart sound. And you can capture these signals with the implanted device, you can average them over time, and you can measure multiple times a day and then trend them. Not only do you find is there or isn't there an S3, but you also find out how loud that S3 is or what the magnitude of vibration associated with it is. You see uh, a recording at the bottom that m monitors uh, respiration, and this is actually impedance obtained from a device, uh, in this specific case it was a pacemaker, but a device to monitor uh, thoracic impedance, and uh, you're looking at the electrical vector between electrodes in the heart and the can on the chest, in between there is some lung. When you take a breath in, there is more air captured uh, in between the electrodes, 
air being a poor conductor, impedance rises. Conversely, when you take a breath out, there's less air in between, the impedance will drop, and you can monitor respiratory rate, and you can measure respiratory rate very, very precisely with this method. You also get a, method, a measure of the relative tidal volume. If you take a deeper breath, you're going to get a greater excursion of impedance. That is directly proportional to tidal volume, as has been validated. The other uh, sensors in this algorithm include average thoracic impedance. So when the lungs get wetter, there's a drop in thoracic impedance. Heart rate, uh, it is an implantable device. And activity, the same accelerometer that picks up the heart sounds can also monitor your activity, just like your watch or your Fitbit or whatever it is uh, you might wear. What I'm showing here is a modified receiver operator curve showing sensitivity on the y-axis and a measure of one minus specificity on the x-axis. The x-axis, we don't, we're not actually plotting specificity, we're plotting what we call the unexplained alert rate. The unexplained alert rate in the multi-sense trial was the number of times that the algorithm alerted that was not associated with a protocol-defined heart failure event. Now, not all heart failure results in hospitalization. So hospitalization was the predominant heart failure event. We also included the outpatient need for IV diuretics or ultrafiltration. But not all heart failure events result in that. You can have worsening heart failure that you can modify by changing uh, dietary uh, patterns, activity, or taking extra diuretic. And many of these will resolve on their own. Uh, so we didn't use the term false positive because it might have been heart failure. We used the term unexplained alert rate. If you want to use the term false positive rate, uh, feel free, but we thought that was a more accurate explanation. And on the y-axis is sensitivity. This is actually the validation cohort, not the development cohort. And from the development cohort, we chose the value of 16 for a parameter that we now refer to as heart logic. It's a risk alert uh, uh, measurement. It's unitless. It ranges from 0 to 100. And at 16, it seemed to be the inflection point of the receiver operator curve in the development set. And in the validation set, we want it to be two specific endpoints. We wanted a sensitivity of greater than uh, 50%. We actually chose 40% as our statistical barrier because we knew the absolute value would be greater than 50%. And we wanted fewer than two unexplained alerts in a patient year. You can see there that we met both primary endpoints, sensitivity of 70%, unexplained alert rate of 1.47. So it met both the sensitivity and specificity uh, boundaries that we had set for this. Uh, it's now available. It can be programmed between 6 and 40. Uh, the nominal threshold of 16, as I mentioned, met both primary endpoints. Interestingly, 14 through 22 also met both co-primary endpoints. And what really amazed me when we first looked at the data on the validation data set was there was a 34-day window from the alert to the heart failure event meaning that this is not an emergency when somebody goes into alert. And what I often advise people is if you get a uh, message that your patient's in alert on the weekend, wait till Monday, you have time. If Monday's busy, look on Tuesday. If Tuesday's not so good, Wednesday's fine. Uh, we generally look twice a week. We just build it into our work pattern and we don't uh, go chasing every uh, alert. So I showed you an alert uh, metric that we developed that is foreign to everybody at first. And we created an alert above 16. And what does that really mean to you clinically? Well, we attempted to answer this also using the multi-sense data, looking at what's referred to as an event rate ratio calculation. Simply the number of events that occur when you're in alert divided by the number of days in alert. Conversely, comparing that to the number of events out of alert and the number of days out of alert. So if you make a ratio of those two, it's the relative risk increase when you're in alert. And uh, we uh, wanted to compare that to an NT-PRO BNP, which is also a very good marker. We had a baseline NT-PRO BNP on all patients in this trial done at a core lab. So we had a valid uh, metric at the beginning of the trial. And what you see on the left are actually two bars. There's a blue one that's obvious. There's also little red ones that you may not see quite so easily. They're down here. This is the uh, event rate ratio, uh, or sorry, the 
yes, the event rate ratio. For patients when they're in alert versus those out of alert, you make a ratio of the two at the nominal value of th threshold of 16, the ratio is 10 to 1, 0.8 events per patient year versus 0 0.08 uh, events per patient year. On the right, and this is for a variety of thresholds, the, it varies between 8 and 12 in terms of the event rate ratio. On the right is the performance of the baseline NT-Pro BNP. It performed well, but not nearly as well as the heart logic metric. This was only measured at baseline, but using a cutoff of 1,000, it's an event rate ratio of about 3 to 4. And the thing that I find very important from a diagnostic is it's relatively quiet. If you look at the threshold of 16 and the percent of patient days spent in a patient alert, in a uh, heart logic alert, you'll find that only 16% of patient days were spent in alert. At baseline, this same population, if you use a cutoff of 1,000 for NT-Pro BNP, 40% of this population had an NT-Pro BNP over 1,000. So if you use NT-Pro BNP to pick the patients you want to worry about, you've got a lot of patients to worry about. If you use heart logic, it's many fewer. Are these data the same things? No, they are not. This is a two by two analysis. The two on the left are the low NT pro BNP, the two on the right are the high NT pro BNP, and then divided further into not in heart logic alert, in alert, not in heart logic alert, in heart logic alert. The two groups I want you to focus on are the low risk group, which had an event rate of 0.02, so low baseline NT pro BNP, not in heart logic alert. The event rate is very, very low. If you think we're cherry picking, that was 53% of the follow up of the entire multisense population. Compare that to the high risk group, in heart logic alert, high NT pro BNP. That group had an event rate of one or 50 fold higher than the low risk group. And the next highest risk group was the uh, in heart logic alert, low NT pro BNP, it was about 23.5 fold higher. So heart logic can be used in combination with NT-Pro-BNP to further risk stratify. So in summary, HeartLogic was established and validated in the multi-sense trial with a sensitivity of 70% unexplained alert rate of 1.47 events per patient year. At a nominal value of 16, other values can be tailored to your preference for sensitivity or specificity. It predicted the risk of a heart, heart failure event independent of baseline variables. Threshold of 16 was exceeded a meeting of 34 days prior to the event, with 89% of the true positives happening at least two weeks after the alert. The event rate, uh, your, the event rate risk is tenfold higher when in alert versus out of alert. Conversely, patients out of alert are at low risk and resources may be allocated to those with greater need. It's a better predictor than a baseline NT pro BNP and it's presented to the clinician with details and trends to support an in alert state. Further studies are needed, and in that regard, we are in the process of conducting the Manage HF clinical trial that is funded by Boston Scientific. Phase one is a group of 200 patients now fully enrolled in whom we're learning and refining the integration and alert management process. And phase two will be a randomized controlled trial, morbidity mortality trial that will be endpoint driven. We're looking forward to that. And I just wanted to give one quick case before I finish. Several will show this. This is the direction and magnitude of changes of the centers in heart logic. Uh, S1 drops by about 23%, S3 up by 42%, thoracic impedance drops by 14%. Respiratory rate only increases 11%, but we can measure that very precisely. Rapid shallow breathing index, the index of uh, respiratory rate to tidal volume. It, a big decrease in activity and a small increase in heart rate, but again, can be measured accurately. My patient uh, is a 68-year-old man with ischemic heart disease. He had a prior MI, then a big one in January 2018. You can see his other past history. He uh, became to my attention actually on May 3rd of uh, th this past year when he went into heart logic alert. You can see here the detail. This is the third heart sound. The third heart sound became louder and his thoracic impedance had dropped. He had a bump in respiratory rate that actually was coming back down already, and uh, his activity level wasn't changing. So this was driven mainly by heart sounds and thoracic impedance. We gave him a bigger dose of diuretic afterwards, 
And about two weeks afterwards, he was still in heart logic alert. You can see it's down to 10, but to get out of alert, we want people to drop below six. We don't want to flicker on and off alert. We want to treat them till they're off alert. And you can see the individual sensors were uh, changing. The median per period, I'm sorry, the average period in multi-sense was 38 days in alert, a median of 30. When you treat people, it's often less, but they don't go in and out of alert very quickly. You do get reminded of the alert once a week. It just reminds you to look at the data, not get too excited, and keep monitoring your patient. In this case, we kept doing what we were doing. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop. Thank you. All right, so what we're gonna do is, is have a little Q&A for about five or six minutes between speakers. And we'll, uh, we'll use the entire panel to answer those questions. So it doesn't have to be just John. We'll give John a little bit of a breather at times. So I'm happy for the audience to come forth and ask questions, but while we're waiting, I, I thought I'll kind of dive a little into it. Um, you know, one of the things you said is that the alert can give you an indication about 34 days in advance, and, and that's usually in patients who are chronic heart failure or gradually accumulating weight and drifting into heart failure. How does it work in the acute setting? If you have an acute ischemic episode or you take this boatload of salt, uh, do you see quick changes in multi-sense or does it give you an alert fast enough that you can do something about it or even that takes a little while to drift up? Uh, John, why don't you I'll, go for it? I'll go ahead. Um, so when I was training, we had this great concept of flash pulmonary edema. We thought something happened, you know, somebody ate a hot dog and all of a sudden they were in pulmonary edema. It turns out that's a rare event. Um, it can happen, but it's a rare event. And multi-sense is more of a trend over time. It does use multiple types of logic in order to calculate that value. It's not a simple weighted average of anything. So decomposing it would be a bit of a challenge. Uh, but it, it doesn't flick really quickly, but over a, a couple of days, it can go from fairly low to fairly high. So it does change relatively rapidly, but fortunately, that physiology is an uncommon one. Got it. So one thing I would add to that is, we know in chronic heart failure, the lymphatics adapt and the airspace changes in the lungs are gonna be oftentimes slower to change, particularly for a chronic heart failure patient. In a more acute patient, you know, if you think about the things that make up heart logic, um, heart sounds and heart rate in particular can change quite dramatically, and therefore your heart logic index can rapid can can sometimes rapidly change. And we have had cases where we've seen a heart logic index come into the abnormal range within three days of, of what we think was a trigger. Uh, examples being AFib, for example, when a patient flips into AFib and then they then they subsequently develop an alert, oftentimes two or three days later. So I wouldn't say that you should expect that it will happen on the same day or maybe even the next day, but within 72 hours of a major acute event like arrhythmias or acute uh, myocardial dysfunction, I think you actually will expect to see some changes because they affect the heart sounds, they affect uh, heart rate. So yeah, The other thing that you see is if you start losing by the pacing, you'll actually see the alert go up. Got it. Pretty quick too. Got it. Yeah. So we have two heart failure physicians and we have one electrophysiologist in the center. <laughs> so 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 I think it's important to kind of understand that, you know, there's a fair amount of resistance from many heart failure physicians to try to understand devices. And understandably it's scary. And then there are EP physicians who don't necessarily want to pay any attention to the heart failure diagnostics. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's an anomaly out here to have folks that are actually interested in device diagnostics because this is the future. This is how we're going to prevent heart failure readmissions by actually working together uh, and people kind of trying to understand this phenomenon that's going on within the heart out here. So Dr. Nair, let me ask you this question. As an electrophysiologist, you see the heart failure, the, the heart logic is 16. Do you try to decompose it? Do you kind of go back into and say, oh, did the heart rate go up? Or did the, you know, was there a change in the respiratory rate? Or do you take the value at face value? Or would you say that it takes a while to get used to the number and, and adapt to it? So what is your individual strategy for this? So, uh, no, we use that heart logic alert number as just a, um, a trigger for us to look. But anytime we have an alert, actually open it up 
we look at the contributing factors, and that's the beauty of it, is you don't have to just trust the number. The number is there for your staff to kind of give you that alert, but you have the capability of opening it up, looking at what the contributing factors are, and putting two and two together. And, you know, just looking at the patient's history probably will give you an idea of what is going on. Got it. Got it. So getting used to the different components initially, I think, helps you understand what it means. And then once you use it a while, uh, you know, enough times you get used to that number and then start using it like a blood pressure variable or a heart rate variable because it, it becomes user friendly. So that's a good point. Um, uh, John, uh, so we're asking for a culture change out here. We're asking for folks to kind of look proactively and figure out which patients are moving in the wrong direction and then intervene. Uh, how do you feel that is disseminating in the heart failure community? And, and what do you think really is important to kind of help disseminate that message? That, that's a great question. And there, there are two aspects to this. One is, in the long term, the majority of the data eventually has to go back to the patient. Mm -hmm. I, I often uh, compare it to managing diabetes, and uh, there's no endocrinologist out there that wants to see every glossed blood sugar. Uh, now, this isn't giving you every piece of data every day. You're just getting the ones that are off algorithm. And you're teaching them to monitor their weights and signs and symptoms to begin with. You can give them flexible diuretic uh, uh, regimens in order to manage it. But when they do go into heart logic alert, then many times they're going to be asymptomatic and there's not going to be an obvious thing going on. And what we're testing in Manage HF is the pre-symptomatic treatment of uh, of uh, preemptively jumping in and treating heart failure. So we want to be able to get in there and treat it early and prevent something from happening. And many times, uh, you know, you had that question about uh, flash pulmonary edema, more or less, it smolders sometimes for weeks or a month before it flashes. And you want to get it well before they're symptomatic. Many times when they're symptomatic, they're rushing to the emergency room. Right. Andrew, can I ask you a quick question before yeah. I get uh, Davey up to speak? Uh, Maybe you can start migrating up to the podium out here. Um, a quick question for you. You know, the, most of the patients we're talking about are hep ref, right? They're reduced injection fraction. They have implanted devices. Is this, again, I'm asking you to speculate out here. Do you think there is any potential value for something like this in the hep ref population, which you and I know constitutes almost 50% of the heart failure readmissions? For the technology, there absolutely is, and I'm, I'm very invested in the intersection. Uh, if you want to look at the model where that's shown to be quite quite clearly true uh, and valid is the CardioMEMS population. We have one of the largest CardioMEMS populations at KU, over 100 patients, and 70% of those are HEFPEF. And what we learned is that by being proactive about diuretic adjustment ahead of time, that's one of the best ways and most evidence-based ways for preventing hospitalizations for heart failure and actually caring for those patients. So if we can emulate that, this technology that we have in ICD and CRT therapy in a HEFPEF uh, population, there is a, that's a much less invasive thing than in doing a catheter-based uh, implant of a, of a device. And so I think a lot of us in the heart failure space are actually more enthusiastic than what the heart failure general community would sort of make everyone believe. Uh, I think it really just comes down to finding the right way to safely monitor and intervene. And we're still trying to figure that out. Great. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Nair, stage is yours. Thank you. I'm just going to wait for the screen to come up. I think it's up here. It, uh, I have up. it. Uh, it should be up. It's up here. So I want to thank Boston Scientific for putting together this collaborative team because I think it makes, uh, this is where we're headed for, so it makes a big difference for us to work as a team. And what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes or so is try to show you um, the approach that we have taken center of how we are, we are managing um, heart, heart, uh, heart failure patients in a, a collaborative, multidisciplinary fashion. Still working on it. Nope. Debbie, Nair, thank you. Number three, Steve, please. How is it up there? I did it proactively for her, I think, before she came on, so that must have set it off. 
by being proactive. So, all this out. Really. so all right, there you go. We are not trying to be stratified, but we are being proactive here. So here are my disclosures. It is not advancing for me. You can give me that. Thank you. All right. So what are the goals of, for us in our heart failure patients? What are we trying to achieve in patient monitoring? So the number one thing is identifying patients who have worsening heart failure. So you, you really don't want to see them when they come into the ER gasping for breath or uh, they are in your office with significant weight gain. What you're trying to see is if you can get them at that early stage where you can do a corrective treatment that is simple. The second thing that you're trying to do is see if you can provide some feedback to the physicians. Maybe that'll help them take those resources they, they have and use it on the sicker patients and not have to do multiple visits on their stable chronic heart failure patients and use the really needed visits in those sicker patient population. The third thing, obviously, is providing feedback to the patient because it makes a huge difference if you can give the patient charge of their health and maybe that will encourage healthy choices in your patient. We actually, you know, it's, it's kind of funny the way we put it, we actually have our patients carry know your numbers. Now our patients have added the heart logic alert number, the heart logic index number on their know your numbers. Um, so it's kind of made a big difference for them. Um, and, the, and the, of course, the fourth thing is treating, it, treating any worsening heart failure when it occurs. Uh, Dr. Bimo kind of went over this, and I hope the our future is this multi-sensor heart failure monitoring solution that integrates these physiologic sensors into an algorithm that helps identify this worsening heart failure, the main thing being that this is a proactive uh, feature. And what it does is these sensors are integrated into the Resonate family of ICD and CRTD platform um, with Boston Scientific. These sensors are automatically evaluate the signs and symptoms of heart failure. Once these are, um, these are collected, the, the beauty about it is it is automated and it's ambulatory. And these, this, that, this heart failure status indicator is available to you remotely or in clinic and you can act upon it. So let me start with my case. Um, my patient is a 59-year-old gentleman who had a coronary disease, had stents in February of 2018, had an ejection fraction of 20%, uh, was on goal-directed medical therapy with left bundle branch block, and class three heart failure symptoms. Um, in the year 2017 through 2018, he's had seven admis admissions for heart failure exacerbations, had ischemic workup in a couple of those uh, admissions. Um, again, had a really uh, hard time with this heart failure. He was referred by the heart failure team to the EP service for device for CRTD therapy. And in July of 2018, he, um, he had a resonate CRTD implanted uh, with the heart logic um, algorithm. And the heart logic alert threshold was set at 16. So our collaborative team consists of our heart failure physician, which could be the patient's general cardiologist or the interventional cardiologist that manages their medications. Um, working along with the heart failure nurse practitioner, the EP physician and the EP nurse practitioner, the device clinic uh, nurse, and our heart failure remote clinic nurse. So this is kind of the team that takes care of our heart failure patients. So when the heart failure team recognizes that there's a patient that needs, um, that has congestive heart failure um, and sends them, sends them for a device implant, they almost always get a Resonate ICD or CRTD device because of this um, feature in, in the device. And once they have the device implanted, we set a heart logic uh, alert uh, threshold. And again, remember, this is a programmable threshold. The nominal value is 16, but you don't have to use 16. You can actually look at their numbers and look at their sensor data and, and pick it depending on. So it's a really programmable position set uh, threshold. Most of the time, we do end up using 16. Uh, we do set them up with the latitude remote monitoring as well. So after his implant, in August of 2018, um, he had a latitude alert, um, and his heart logic index was 40, 48. And you can see um, it was there's a there's a baseline, and he jumps up to to 48. And this is kind of what you get uh, when you first look at it. So the heart the, the device clinic the device clinic nurse gets this alert. And the way it works for us is once an alert comes in, it comes to both the EP and the heart failure service line and an automatic task is created in our EMR. 
And at that point, the heart failure service takes the first step and calls the patient to check on symptoms there. And I'll, I will tell you, most of the time they're asymptomatic at that point. Uh, they check on their diet habits, their medication compliance. They almost always increase their diuretic regimen um, and they request a remote device check. At that point, the, the task is also sent to the EP nurse practitioner, and so they are expecting that remote device check to come in that day. And so the EP nurse practitioner looks at the lead parameters, looks at pacing percentages, arrhythmia burden, and et cetera. So um, Dr. Bima kind of showed you this, uh, this uh, slide, but what is what the beauty about the, the algorithm is that the alert precedes an event by at least 34 days. So you really don't, I mean, as he said, if it's a Friday, you can wait till Monday or Tuesday. And we kind of do it on um, two days a week as well, uh, because it kind of works with our, our schedule. Now, if, if something comes along and they're free, they'll look it up. But the, uh, the beauty is that 89% of the events had alert at least two weeks prior, and the medium time was at least 34 days. So this is kind of what you get when you want to look deep dive into. So for our patient, these were the contributing factors. So you can look it up once you get that number. And for him, it was, you can see the S3 um, got louder, the S1 got uh, quieter, so the ratio is up. Uh, the thoracic impedance has started to come down, respiratory rate is up, and his nighttime heart rate is up, and his sleep incline is elevated as well. The patient was still pretty asymptomatic. Um, he just said, it's, you know, he felt fine. Um, and he's obviously comparing it to his bad events that he's had where he had to come into the hospital. Uh, his diuretics were increased by the heart failure team. The patient was noted to be in atrial fibrillation by the EP nurse practitioner. Um, he was started on an antiarrhythmic drug and anticoagulation was started. They discussed ablation therapy. He's, he'd had multiple hospitalizations. He wanted to kind of hold off, he wanted to try drug therapy. He had a T and a cardioversion performed. Two weeks after his cardioversion, he uh, comes out of alert status. And here, it's pretty clear, and again, uh, something to remember, they don't just come off alert right away. It takes a little bit of time, so just be patient and just watch that downward trend. So he comes out of alert status. Four weeks after the cardioversion, he is back in alert again, and we have an alert of 27 at this point. And at this time, we kind of are mimicking the same thing, elevated S3, the S3, S1 ratio is up, and the nighttime heart rate is uh, gone up again. So our algorithm pretty much tells us if the patient either, if they remain in alert without a downward trend after about two weeks of diuretic therapy or if they keep having repetitive alerts, we actually bring the patient in for an office visit or we have a, a, a home visit for the patient. And um, the heart failure APN, irrespective of the patient's symptoms, uh, gets a detailed assessment and sometimes labs. Um, in a patient that has a CRTD, we get an EKG, we confirm adequate body pacing, sometimes we get an x-ray, we get halters if needed, and our EPAPN, or the electrophysiologist, actually evaluates those results. So the patient was seen in heart failure clinic, he continued to be asymptomatic, um, uh, nt pro -BNP was drawn along with other labs, and his nt pro -BNP value was 1650, and his EKG, he was back in atrial fibrillation. He was seen by the EP nurse practitioner as well because of because the fact that he was back in AFib. Uh, his device check showed recurrent AFib with a controlled ventricular rate, some inadequate body pacing from some rapid rates at night, um, and a, a catheter ablation was discussed uh, with the patient at that point. So Dr. Beamer showed you this slide. It's very important to see the fact that when you have a, you know, what this helps you do is when you combine heart logic index with a baseline NT pro BNP, it helps you uh, substratify this, these patients even more. So you can identify that really very low risk patient who has an event rate of 0 0.2, 0 0.02 event uh, per patient year. So that's a patient that you don't want to spend all that resources on. So you can kind of keep them away. They're doing well, leave them be. And then you can put all your resources and target all your resources to that patient that either has uh, a heart logic alert that's, you know, or a heart logic alert that's over 16 and has a high pro BNP value, sorry, uh, or somebody who has a, a lower pro BNP but has a high heart logic alert. So the patient actually went catheter ablation for his atrial fibrillation um, and he came out of alert and he's ma maintained sinus rhythm since then. Three weeks later, he's out of alert status um, and he since then has stayed out of alert and out of the hospital. 
and it's been almost a, almost a year, you know, there, there are people actually asking for him where he's at because he's not showing up in the hospital, which has kind of been really good. Um, so the other thing that we do is for out of alert patients, we just monitor them remotely. Um, they have in office visits alternating with an EP and a heart failure. So we see them once a year in EP, once a year in heart failure. And we really don't bring them in unless they have any kind of issues. Dr. Beamer told you about this as well. When you have a, when you set a, um, when you look at the heart, uh, logic event ratio at a nominal heart logic threshold of 16, if you are an in alert state, you have a 10 times higher chance of having a heart failure event. So that is why it's, you know, it's, we are more proactive about taking care of these patients. Again, heart in the multisense trial, the heart logic provided the strongest restratification along, com compared to the other patient demographics. So in summary, the heart logic is a promising step that combines multiple sensors that track key physiologic trends related to heart failure and combines them into this composite index that monitors things over time and is designed to deliver proactive alerts. And the reason why we think it's important to have this or is, is the game changer for us is because number one, it's highly sensitive. Number two, we have a very low alert burden. And number three, we have weeks of advance notice to actually do something proactively that might change the patient's uh, course of uh, heart failure. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Devi. That was a great talk and good insights. So one of my pet peeves um, about, you know, classifying non-responders uh, by symptoms or by, you know, quality of life in Minnesota living with heart failure questionnaire score is kind of, I think, almost outdated. I mean, when you have a device that is giving you continuous streaming data as to where the position of that patient is, uh, you can compare that patient with him or herself, really categorize them as non-responders rather than using all the other different surrogate measures. And I think, you know, the, uh, the multi-sense, uh, you know, uh, heart logic clearly provides that opportunity for us to really begin to recategorize how we categorize non-responders, right? So let me ask you a quick question. Um, and this is more, you know, you created this team of heart failure and in and, and EP uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, requires champions out there. And we'll, we'll get to the champion aspect uh, later after Andrew's talk. But, you know, something as simple as this, something what we're doing at our center, we're trying to co-manage some of these heart failure patients with internists, trying to create algorithms for how internists can look after these patients. Do you think there's any value that this uh, using heart logic or multi-sense uh, capabilities can be uh, internist friendly? Uh, and, and the first line of defense may be in the internist practice before they even come to the heart failure or the EP's attention. Any thoughts? I'd love thoughts from each of you. I think it's, it's simple enough. And I think they, the, the question is going to be education. And if you can get the internist on board, I think it's a great idea because they are usually the, the, they are the first person that gets a call. And, you know, I think it, I think it will make a, a lot more easier for the heart failure team to actually you know, put their effort on that really high risk patient, um, the patients that are having a high heart logic alert and having a low pro BNP, those might, those might be really good patients that can be just managed with diuretics and don't need a lot more uh, done. But I think it still needs a collaborative effort between, because when you put a device in as an EP, my thought is if I put in a device, I'm responsible for it as to what comes out of it. Not and, everybody feels that way. Yeah, but, yeah. You, know, it's, <laughs> you know, it's not just putting a device and I'm done. So I think that's where it counts, and I think that's where the collaborative effort came in. John, I know you're chomping so at I, the bits out there. Well, I, I, I actually have to credit this to uh, Naraj Varma, who used the term uh, automation with safety monitoring. Uh, I think you can create a relatively uniform response. You know, check on medication compliance, check on their rhythm, but you can create an algorithm that works with the majority of patients. Where the specialists come in is making sure that the ones that aren't responding to that are taken care of. So um, let's say the majority of patients, you're doubling the furosemide or bumetanide for a given period of time. Monitor their electrolytes and renal function. If, if, if you overshoot, you'll pick it up and you can replace your divot. Right. 
it's not as dangerous as, say, insulin. Right. Um, where you may not get a second chance with a drug as potentially lethal as that. For us, it might not so bad. And as long as you're monitoring, it's when you don't monitor that you can get into trouble. So automation with safety monitoring, I think, can be done for the majority of patients. And then when they're off the servo control, that's when you really need the uh, specialist to come in and re-equilibrate things or make a new diagnosis as to why they don't behave. Great. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, I think the answer, like a lot of times, is it depends. You know, I think for the engaged internist, the engaged family medicine physician, and we have a number of those that already interface with us with Heartflare. Take Entresto, for example. You know, we've had a hard time getting buy-in for that within the cardiology community, and we certainly have had a hard time within internal medicine getting them to be comfortable using this kind of scary drug, even though it's not that scary when you get comfortable with it. But then on the, hand, on the other hand, you'll have a handful or sometimes more than a handful of physicians who are all on board and they want to partner with you in caring for the patient that they share with you. That kind of physician can absolutely t- take this technology and run with it. No, no less so than a heart failure physician or an EP physician. So I think it just comes down to belief in the diagnostic modality and, and comfort level and not being intimidated by it. Got it. So let me kind of digress to one more EP question, and then we'll get Andrew up here. Um, you have a patient with a heart logic of, let's say, 10, coasting along 10, you know, kind of class 3-ish, but they're living at 10. Have you ever tried, or do you think it would be worthwhile trying, is to bring them in, optimize their devices, you know, adjust their AV to VV timings, or use vectors, you know, to kind of change their vector pacing, and then look at the impact and how that moves the needle? because Diuretics are good, uh, but you know a lot of our EPs want to do something electrophysiological. And and do you think there's any value to trying that? I think we, we have we have tried it because we do believe that if you stay out of alert, you have a less chance of having future events. And I think Multisense did show that whether it, it's above sixteen or not, staying under six has some value to it. So we have we have actually. Um, we do optimize, you know, whether it makes sense or not, but we do, we try AV optimization, we try multi-site, multi-site pacing. So we try a lot of things. We kind of consider them as non-responders, uh, even though they are, they feel like they're responding. Um, okay. Or we sometimes actually um, have to change um, vectors and programming and stuff. And even in patients who have like AFib, uh, we actually restratify who gets ablation quicker, right. depending on whether they go into alert or not. Got it. Great. Thank you. Andrew? Well, it's always dangerous to be the last presenter, and especially when I'm standing between you and dinner. Uh, But uh, I think it's really fun to be a heart failure doc uh, talking to an EP audience. Uh, 2009 had two things that I remember. One is I was a resident under this guy, uh, Dr. Singh. Uh, when I was at Mass General, but also the Made It CRT uh, had just come out in the New England Journal. And I think we learned a few things. We learned that heart flare hospitalizations actually precede the mortality that the heart flare world loves to obsess over is, uh, you know, mortality is the only thing that matters. Well, heart flare hospitalizations matter too. Um, but also what was exciting about that time was this intersection of EP and heart flare. I actually thought about going into EP for this reason. And then, of course, like a lot of heart failure docs, I fell in love with the LVAD and the rest is history. But here we are again, 10 years later, and we're talking about the intersection of EP and heart failure. And I, I'm really excited about this opportunity to build bridges again. Um, there are my disclosures. Um, so I think I get the advantage of having heard what the other two speakers talked about and being able to kind of be intentionally redundant about the high level points that I think are just important for you all to take home. And so really there's an opportunity to intersect about what really this is all about. And the 30,000th view is that heart failure is a gigantic epidemic. Some really depressing data have come out recently. I don't know if you saw the most recent study pointing out that heart failure is back on the rise, particularly in young people. Uh, one of my colleagues, Sadia Khan, was the first author, the senior author on that paper in uh, JAMA Cardiology. And then also, we're not so good at giving guideline-based therapies. We learned that from the CHAMP Heart Flare Registry. Uh, less than 10% of patients actually get the right meds and optimize the right dose. So we have a lot of work to do, and this epidemic's not going away. And as a heart failure doc, I just feel like, you know, we all need to be on this crusade to really tackle this and also tackle the economics of it, which is really 
caught up in the hospitalization. So if all we focus on is life and death and we don't find ways to treat people at home, we're going to go bankrupt. And so this is the number one cost and the number one diagnosis for the CMS population that's hospitalized today. So we really need to be thinking about this. And one out of four patients come back within 30 days. So this actually matters, predicting heart failure events. The other thing I think that helps intuitively is that there's a trajectory of heart failure when it progresses. It's not like the patient just shows up in the hospital after one day of being in heart failure. This has been going on, as you heard, for several days. It begins with changes in stroke volume, changes in heart sounds, changes in left atrial pressure transmitted back from the left ventricle, changes in sympathetic tone, changes in heart rate related to that and heart rate variability, changes in what the lungs see, pulmonary fluid, which may be transmitted in thoracic uh, impedance, changes in weight, changes in low extremity swelling, and then finally symptoms. So if we can get upstream, wouldn't it be nice to be proactive rather than reactive? And I feel like we've been practicing heart failure in the dark ages in many ways by waiting till people develop symptoms. And uh, I think many of us are trying to say, let's figure out a way to get upstream. This technology, and you've seen this slide now three times, uh, is intentional, is to point out that there are a number of ways that we can measure biometric measurements uh, to basically demonstrate this physiology. So I won't go into that slide, but just to remind you that heart sounds can be detected most notably. My favorite one is the S3. Heart flare docs love the S3. We just can't ever hear them. When we hear them, uh, we say this patient has heart flare, just like when we see the neck veins go up. Um, but we're not that good at hearing them. We probably aren't that good at doing that good a job of listening either. Um, so which patient of these had a heart flare event, the one on the left or one on the right? And obviously, it's very hard to tell the difference. Both of them, patient A and patient B, had a drop in intrathoracic impedance. And most heart failure docs, just to be full on, fully disclosing, they don't really buy into using intrathoracic impedance as a marker of heart failure by itself. And here's why. Because you really can't tell just looking at one, var one variable. That same marker could be reflecting of ARDS, could be reflecting of trolley from a blood transfusion, could be reflecting of pneumonia. It's just telling you that there's some, something, some kind of fluid in the lungs. It doesn't tell you that it's cardiogenic. But the other markers can give you a lot more clues. A rise in the S3, a drop in the S1, a change in respiratory rate, a change in rapid shallow breathing, and of course the heartlegic index capturing all three is going to be much more intuitively uh, pointing to heart flare as the diagnosis rather than some other cause of fluid in the, uh, fluid in the lungs. So how do we, you know, just kind of dovetailing, this is just talking about best practices. I don't think anybody here has it figured out. It's not like this has been around for a long time. It's really been around for about a year. So we're all sort of learning this together. So what we've done is we've embraced remote monitoring just like you guys embraced it in CRM and HRM. And so we've decided that heart flare remote monitoring is going to be a thing. And that's why we've built into all the different types of remote monitoring, including CardioMEMS, including HeartLogic, and other new novel ways of doing remote monitoring. CMS, by the way, has put the stamp on this. So we don't need to wait for the Heart Flare Society to endorse it. CMS is saying go. And they're giving us ways to pay for this. So if you look at the way we've staffed our, our remote monitoring space, we actually have two FTEs, two nurses, that are what the administration, I've convinced them to believe, uh, they are revenue generating nurses that do monthly billing. And you can do this creatively. If you make the creative economical arg argument to your administrators, which we've learned how to do, you can actually get nurses that focus exclusively on heart flare remote monitoring. They interface with the primary cardiologist, very similar to how you've, how you've heard this done. We also have LPNs that help us with billing because a lot of the LPN role can just be documentation and you can take a lot of the clinical work out of the hands of the uh, LPNs and give it, give it to, give it, give the billing to the LPNs. So patients that come into the hospital are probably the best candidates for this technology. And uh, so, you know, trying to convince our EPs to preference this device is a challenge, as you can imagine, but it makes a lot of sense for a patient that's been hospitalized to benefit from this technology. Patients never seen a hospitalization probably doesn't have to have this particular device, uh, although the hospitalizations may come down the line. Um, our team helps identify candidates of whatever the remote monitoring technology might be. They get involved, they help consent the patients and help educate them. And we try to interface with our EPs to implant the device of our preference. We kind of like you heard, we review the data twice a week. This is true for cardamoms, this is true for heart logic. You don't need to react to a point in time, you react to a trend. That's a, hopefully a point you take away from this. You look for the trend, you don't look for the change in a day. And if it's outside of the range that we think is appropriate for that patient, and you've heard this before and it's true, there's a, there's a nominal number of 16 for heart logic that everyone has a sweet spot. Every patient can be compared to themselves. And so you find out what that patient's sweet spot is by watching them when they first get the device and watching them over alerts. 
And if they have a change, that's when you think this might be meaningful. And then our coordinator communicates the, the orders as, as directed by the physician or the nurse practitioner. So now moving through quickly through some examples of cases. I begin with a case, um, and I just have, I think, four or five cases, and they each have a teaching point. So this particular case is sort of the bread and butter. It says this guy, he's 83, he's like a typical reduced ejection fraction, chronic heart failure patient. He loves ice cream. You'll see he loves, to, he does like, is, cannot be dissuaded from eating two pints of ice cream every day. I'm not kidding. Um, and so it's like anything. He has an alert, and he's not even reachable. This is real world. You can't find the patient. And then a few days later, he's calling in and saying, you know what, I've got some swelling in my legs. He's an alert. The alert's being driven by S3, S3, S1 ratio, as well as respiratory rate contributions. Um, so it turns out he ran out of his as-needed torsamide, so he was directed to take that. And then uh, continues to progress, as you can see on May 8th. You know, now he's got uh, further, uh, further changes, and he's still an alert. He's up 14 pounds. And so finally, the torsamide's conver converted to daily uh, rather than as-needed. And then he comes back to clinic and he remains symptomatic, but not as severe. And over time, he comes out of alert. So this is a good example of basic diuretic intervention. Get him back on the diuretic. He is in alert and then he comes out of alert. But it, as you heard, it takes a little bit of time. Same patient still eating two pints of ice cream. A couple of months later, um, he's going back into alert. And again, it's driven by S3, S3, S1. And this is sort of a pattern that we've noticed is that uh, it seems like that's the early markers, the heart sounds, and then oftentimes you'll see the thoracic impedance change, and then you start seeing changes in respiratory rate and nighttime heart rate. And so he's still eating two pints of ice cream. The torsamide has increased to 40 BID. Um, he continues to have problems with abdominal distension, peripheral edema. I think he struggled a lot with right heart failure, actually. And he's actually having some lightheadedness, and then he gets more IV diuretics, and then he gets it ultimately admitted at that point with the heart lo logic index of 21 gets a bunch of weight removed by uh, diuretics, about 20 pounds, and then he comes out of alert. So the point of the first two cases, same patient is, patient goes into alert, gets a diuretic intervention, over a period of time they come out of alert. And all of the markers that go into the heart logic make intuitive sense. Okay, a different patient, 62, um, has a CRT device, again, reduced ejection fraction, has a lot of comorbidities like our heart failure patients do comes in um, uh, and then has an alert that is uh, index comes in at 17, again, driven by the S3, S3, S1 ratio as the early markers. Um, he, start, he actually denies any symptoms. I like this case because this patient isn't really bothered. But despite that, he's instructed to increase his LASIK. So this is our team being proactive and going ahead and saying, you know, despite the fact the patient doesn't really have anything, we're going to go ahead and treat because we think this is real. And so he comes back to clinic on December 4th, and he denies worsening symptoms, but he's actually complaining of lightheadedness and, light, and uh, some dizziness. So that's usually when people want to give uh, some fluid back or back off the diuretics. And actually, again, our team increased the Lasix and increased the spironolactone. We decreased the beta blocker because if you haven't taken care of a lot of heart failure patients, you realize beta blockers make everybody feel terrible. They're obviously great for a lot of things. But if you want people to feel a little bit better and come out of decompensated heart failure, sometimes adjusting the beta blocker can be helpful, especially if they don't have blood pressure. So he comes back on the, on the December 19th, and he's starting to come out of alert already, and he's appearing euvolemic on exam, no medication changes. And then basically, um, we found out that he wasn't actually taking the original dose of laces we wanted him on by increasing it, but he did increase the spironolactone, and he comes out of alert. Um, and this is, again, a guy that didn't have any symptoms, really, was treated, comes out of alert, feels pretty good. Next case, and I have two more, and this is a good case because it involves something other than diuretic adjustment, because people wonder what other things can we do? And so this patient had an alert of 16, again, driven by S3, S3, S1 ratio, re respiratory rate and nighttime heart rate, and then he comes in feeling more fatigued, his weight's up to 311 pounds, and he missed a dose of Lasix, and so it wasn't really clear uh, what should be done for his laces, but it was increased. But he also had Entresto started. And this is really kind of cool because we all believe that Entresto does something different. Um, and then we got to see this uh, play out on the, on the heart logic. So after a couple, uh, basically a couple weeks of Entresto, you saw that he actually came out of alert and, uh, and, and actually had normalization with heart, lo heart logic index of zero. And this is coinciding with what we saw from Pioneer where you saw changes in BNP within three days of the initial dose of Entresto, very dramatic. And so the Entresto really has sometimes a very acute effect that we can see as sort of like another way to augment diuresis. 
And lastly, this is a very recent case, 65-year-old female, and I took care of her in the ICU, very sick. Um, she came into alert actually in February, and in the process of working her up, we discovered that she had severe AI and dilated left ventricle and essentially progressed to cardiogenic shock. Very difficult case because she'd had a number of reoperations previously, had a pseudoaneurysm, was not a good surgical candidate, and was not exactly an ideal TAVR candidate. But we decided that the best option for her, she wasn't really a candidate for any surgical therapies, including that or transplant, uh, was to actually go forward with a uh, TAVR for AI. And you could see how, how dramatically high her heart logic uh, became. I mean, very high S3, very low S1. Um, dramatic changes in respiratory and heart rate and also activity went to very low. She basically became bedridden. And uh, I don't have the final slide because I made these slides before her TAVR, but she had her TAVR just a week or two ago and her heart logic went back to normal. So with no changes and, and we did a lot of things with medicines to try to get her tuned up, but it really wasn't until we fixed the mechanical problem did that uh, resolve. And so the take home is it doesn't really matter what the mechanism of heart flare is. I think that if you look at all the variables that go into heart logic and you see that there's someone's in alert, the best thing to do is to not ignore it. Um, on, conversely, I think this has been brought up. The other value of heart logic is for those patients that have no alert, and then again, if they have low BNP, their event rate is so low that they probably don't need to be followed in the heart flare clinic. So it sort of, again, stratifies patients that could be easily managed by really anybody. And, and then what we always say is once they're having alerts, send them to us. Let, let us take ownership of the heart flare therapies and, and manage the alerts. Um, and so that's how we've organized it. So that's really kind of to summarize, you know, multivariate uh, parameters and trying to use them intuitively while also following the, the data that we have today. So we have a few minutes for questions. So if anybody wants to ask questions, uh, I'm going to, again, take the lead out here while I'm waiting for folks to raise their hands. Um, Andrew, quick question for you. What's the workflow in your clinic? I mean, who is receiving the alert and who's making the decision? Is it at the NP level, the MD level, the RN level? How are, yeah. how are you dealing with it? So what we've tried to do is build our heart failure remote monitoring program in tandem with the existing EP CRM program. And so the, since the EPs put the device in, they, they own the data, they own the alerts. But what we're trying to do, and we've been mostly successful, is carving out the ones that are having alerts to be automatically deflected to us. We can get access to uh, the website and actually can engage with the data ourselves once we know that there's a patient. But the problem is a lot of these patients aren't referred by us. In fact, most patients that make it to me already have a device. So they may be referred by another cardiologist, they get to the EP, they put the device in and we don't know they exist until they have alerts and then they're trafficked to, to us. But again, most of these are not having alerts. They don't need to come to us at all, but we're ready for them when they come. And that's how we've built it. Got it. No, that's, that's, that's super helpful. John, uh, let's kind of look into the future a little bit. We're all moving down the bandwagon of telehealth and virtual care, right? Uh, one of the biggest problems with virtual care is that you don't have any objective parameters. You're kind of mm -hmm. looking at them, you're talking to them. Uh, but here you have something that may potentially provide you all the objectivity that you need for a clinical visit like that. So what are your thoughts about integrated virtual care visits with device diagnostics uh, like the multisense? Any thoughts? No, I, I, when, when we do telemanagement, <clears throat> and you're dealing with patients' weights and symptoms. You already uh, pointed out the symptoms are very vague and ethereal uh, things. And I've learned a lot from our nursing colleagues who study symptoms in more detail. They're fascinating. In a population, they're useful. In individuals, boy, they're hard to manage in and of themselves. And then um, when you... Uh, when you're trying to manage these patients on the phone, you don't have enough data to really make good decisions. This provides data that you can really uh, understand is physiologic and uh, it's actionable. So, I, yeah, I think this is a great way to manage patients, either, you know, an advanced telemanagement or virtual uh, visit, if you will. And I, I do think we're going that direction. But even before that, I think we want the patient to do the majority of the management themselves. And again, we got to get to the point where the data are going to the patient. Great. No, thank you. I think we're running out of time. But any parting thoughts, Andrew, uh, David? Yeah. I just think that what we need to do is continue the narrative to 
embrace this opportunity to take this to the next level. I think that uh, there's a lot of people standing on the sidelines and it's not clear to me why when you spend time with this uh, platform and you spend time with patients that have the alerts on and study them, you become more and more a believer in what the opportunities are. So I think we just need to help advance the narrative. Great. Uh, from my side, I'd say, you know, I, I think that the potential for this is tremendous. Um, and when this gets integrated with our electronic health records and you look at all the clinical covariates and there's a question out there, uh, go ahead. So let me uh, repeat that question. Are you concerned about the renal function when you're try trying to titrate the Lasix uh, without seeing the patient? It's a great question, and uh, my short answer is no. Uh, and because we safety monitor, automation with safety monitoring, and remember, loop diuretics are not nephrotoxic. They do not damage nephron. They do not take out uh, filtering units. They cause functional changes in renal function that are reversible when picked up and managed appropriately. Yeah, I agree with that completely. The number one cause of a rising creatinine in our patients is cardiorenal syndrome, which is best responded to by giving a diuretic. And so we give away and we, we have a protocol for checking renal function. And the most important thing we worry about is drop in potassium and, and, and right. electrolyte. That's actually a potentially life-threatening, particularly when combined with metolazone or other um, non-loop diuretics. Um, but the renal function, I think you can easily right. Keep track I, of them. I do fiercely advocate safety monitoring, okay. but besides that, no, I don't. I don't fear the uh, diuretic. Excellent. Uh, on that note, we're, there's another question. Go ahead. I love it. I haven't had a case of that yet. Um, that's could could I point. could I kind of yeah. extend on that? If yeah. you have somebody whose heart logic is chronically twenty three and, yeah. and whatever you're doing is not changing, um, and you have no other therapies at hand, is that something that you could kind of start triggering right. a conversation? Well, I guess the last case I presented would have been that. I mean, had we not had an option for that poor woman, which I mean, the taver was a total gamble to be honest. It could have gone just as badly as it went right. And that's a patient that we would have been offering, you know, in a purely palliative option uh, because there was really nothing we could do to get her heart logic or her get her out of heart flare without uh, mechanical intervention. But I think the good thing out here is uh, it provides objective evidence over and above whatever your clinical assessment is there. So you have something that is measuring everything internally. Sir, please. Actually, I, I kind of think this is more upstream than cardiomems because cardiomems is going to capture the, the reflection of pressure back to the lungs, and it's not going to capture the intraventricular changes like S3 and S1. So I, I get what you're saying. I think that that's true. And anytime you have changes in catecholamine state due to the heart failure progression, you actually increase the risk of adverse events down the line. That's what we're trying to prevent. But I actually think this is more upstream. That's why you're probably seeing 30 days lead time and multi-sense. And so in, in the sense, it's better because you're getting even more signals up front instead of waiting for left atrial pressure to be transmitted back to the pulmonary diastolic pressures that we see on, with cardiomems. And, and I like monitoring uh, PA pressures, but and we do it, but it, it's noisy and there are many variables that feed into pulmonary artery pressures. It's not just left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And there's a lot of patient engagement that's needed. I, I, I disagree. Think, Thank you. 
Uh, I think it's all interrelated. Uh, I think, you know, you can say whenever you have a neurohormonal state, you need an abnormal trigger. You need some other risk factors like diabetes, hypertension. So it's not a single factor. There's an interplay of several covariates. And when you have something as objective as this that is integrated with those clinical covariates, it gives you a much better sense of how to manage these patients. And I think the future is integrating this into our EHR system. We'll then using that with all the information we have in demographics to really provide patient-centric individualized care. So I, I know we're way beyond our time. I want to thank you all for your engagement and for really hanging out. Uh, I want to thank Boston Scientific. I want to thank Marilyn. I want to thank Laura, all of you for actually orchestrating this. And obviously, of course, uh, the phenomenal faculty out here. Thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.